family. Uh, Happy New Year and welcome to a brand new year 2021, uh, which we hope and pray will be uh, a lot smoother uh, than 2020. No matter what the year holds, though, we know that God is faithful, that God is good, that God is our strength, that he is our refuge, and and he is the one in whom we trust uh, no matter what uh, this year may uh, have in store for us. I'm so glad you've joined us uh, here uh, this morning uh, to worship on this very first uh, Sunday of a brand new year. Uh, We, uh, in this worship service, continue to remember this stunning event uh, that changed the very history of our world, uh, the birth of God's own Son, uh, Jesus Christ. And so uh, this morning, uh, for one final Sunday, we reflect on beautiful carols uh, that celebrate the season and are so deep and theologically profound in the words uh, that they bring to us. We still have uh, the Advent candle completely lit behind me, and I'll remember, remind you that the word Advent means coming, and we've gone through a season of celebrating uh, the coming of our Lord uh, Jesus Christ and all uh, that that brings uh, to us. God's grace, God's mercy, uh, God's kindness poured out uh, upon us. And so uh, this morning I will remind you that we've walked through this over a series of Sundays uh, and remembered uh, a prophecy candle and an angel candle uh, and the shepherd's candle and especially the Christ candle that reflects Christ's purity and and his holiness. And all of that brought to bear various scriptures to remind us uh, of God's amazing plan, a plan that was actually in place before the world uh, was even created. God, sitting above time and space, uh, knew every single thing that would would happen. And so our plan for, for our redemption, for our rescue, was in God's mind and in the son's mind and in the spirit's mind, even before uh, they came uh, to, to be. And so as we uh, once again embrace some of the beautiful music written uh, for this, this occasion, uh, let us draw close uh, to Christ. So welcome, and let me open us in prayer. Oh God, thank you uh, for this most amazing gift that's ever been given even the gift of your, your son, Jesus Christ. And I, I pray that this brand new Sunday of a new, new year, we would continue to reflect upon the miracle that you have done. Oh God, you, thank you that you know all of our needs, but especially our greatest need. 
We needed a savior. We needed a redeemer. We needed a rescuer. And so as we worship this morning and as we come to his table and as we look uh, at really the gospel story in Ephesians chapter 2, I pray that it would be fresh, that it would be new, that it would capture our imagination uh, once again, but then also our, our attention. And God, once again, fresh submission to you, a glad, loving submission uh, to, to you. So God, I, I, I pray this morning that your spirit would be amongst us, whether we're in living rooms, uh, whether uh, we are here in this sanctuary this morning. Oh God, help us uh, to worship you with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our mind and all of our strength. It's in Jesus' mighty name uh, that we pray, amen. Uh, let's uh, stand uh, together and begin to worship as we sing together. together oh god we do come uh, to marvel once again to to worship at your footstool 
Oh, Jesus, you, the babe born in vulnerability, you're the king of all kings and Lord of all lords, seated now high in majesty and authority, power, dominion now and forevermore. God, as we've just sung, oh, why should men on earth be sad since our Redeemer has made us glad when from our sin he set us free all for to gain our liberty? God, thank you for doing the most stunning, profound thing you could have done, mm -hmm. sending your eternal son to take on flesh and bone and to wed deity with humanity, the perfect mediator between God and man, the one who's taken our sin upon himself and given us his righteousness. God, I pray that we would never tire of this story, but it would be the centerpiece of what we believe, but even more so, who we are. Our identity is found in Bethlehem's child. Oh God, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please uh, be seated. We're now into a time of confession. And we'll do that corporately from Psalm 25. And then move into a time of silent prayer. The psalmist leads us in honesty and authenticity. He says, turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. Relieve the troubles of my heart and free me from my anguish. Look on my affliction and my distress and take away all my sins. Would you pray that uh, quietly in your heart and continue to pray silently? Uh, look on my affliction, God, and my distress and take away all my sins. Let's pray quietly while, while Diana plays. Mm -hmm. God, we would say, turn to us and be gracious to us. At times we do feel lonely and afflicted. Oh God, we would pray, relieve the troubles of our hearts, free us from our anguish, look upon our poor and lowly condition and take away all of our sins. But God, I pray in this brand new year that we uh, would experience brand new forgiveness, a restoration, Oh God, thank you that Jesus is the one that brings us peace. He's the one that, that brings us wholeness. Uh, he it, it is the one that assures us uh, that, that God, you, Father, Son, and Spirit, love us with an eternal love, a love that is invincible, a love that is unbreakable, a love that is unquenchable. And I pray that we would gather around that truth uh, this morning. So God, you promise us over and over again that you did not send your son into this world to condemn this world, but that we might be saved through him. And so we believe you and we pray these things based upon his merit and in his name. Amen. Amen. Let us continue to worship as we sing uh, this, this, great, uh, this great Christmas uh, hymn, O Holy Night. Let's sing it together.
as we sing the doxology.
This is one of my favorite stories that I have ever come across. A Quaker family years ago, Civil War time, they lived in Pennsylvania. And much against the father's wishes, his son Jonathan ran off to be enlisted in the cause of the North during this uh, tragic war. A time passed and his family deeply concerned, praying for their son daily. They heard no word over uh, the days and weeks and months uh, that, that came along. And one night, this father uh, went, went to bed, and he no doubt was thinking of his son, and, and, and he fell off into a deep sleep, and he began to dream. And as he dreamed, he dreamed that his son had been wounded in action, and that his son was in deep distress, and he needed his rescue and, and his care. And so this father, the next morning, left the farm, and he did a little bit of, of checking around and asking around, and he learned where the troops uh, might might be. And he made his way in his horse-drawn buggy uh, until he came to, to the scene of where the action had been the previous day. And, and he located the commander uh, of the, the army, and he asked him about his son. And, and the commander knew who his son was uh, by name. But the commander told him, Sir, there's been very heavy action uh, yesterday and earlier this day, and many have fallen wounded on a battlefield. And some of them have been, have been found and, and retrieved, but others, many others are still in the trenches, and we've not been able to get to them. And I have not seen your son. And so the commander gave permission uh, for this father to go try to find his son. And at this point in the day, it was dusk. And so the father lit a, lit a lantern. And he lit this uh, lantern and he let the light fall across this battlefield as he walked out there looking for his son. And the light fell upon wounded young men, some calling for help. And others, too injured to even cry, cry out at all. And... and as it went on, he became aware that this was an overwhelming task. There were so many that had fallen. Uh, and he felt that maybe it was impossible for him to even find his son. But he developed a plan. And so he methodically would comb an area with his lantern. And he would call out loudly over and over again, Jonathan Smith, thy father seeketh after thee. Jonathan Smith, thy father seeketh after thee. And he kept this up, area after area. And once in a while, uh, he would hear a soldier cry out, not his son, but he would hear a soldier say, I wish that were my father, but not his son. But he kept going, and he refused to, to quit or give up. And then, and then he heard it. It was very faint. It was very, just barely audible reply. And he cried out, Jonathan Smith, thy father seeketh after thee. And he heard in his weak voice, Father, over here. And he ran over and he found his son still alive. And his son said to him, I knew you would come. And the father knelt down and he took his own son into his arms and comforted him. And then he dressed his wounds. And he picked him up and he carried him to his buggy and he took him to a safe place to continue to minister to him, and he nursed him back to health. And eventually, he took him home. It's the story of the unquenchable love of a father. We were mortally wounded and in great distress. We were in the most desperate need and care of our heavenly father. And God came, a gentle and yet persistent in the call of his Holy Spirit. And he said, Jay, thy father seeketh after thee. Diana, thy father seeketh after thee. Elizabeth, thy father seeketh after thee. Dawn, thy father seeketh after thee. And he found you, and he breathed life into you. And he dressed your wounds, and he nursed you to health. I say to you this morning, whether you're here in the sanctuary or over Facebook this morning, have you cried out, Father, over here? If you have not, make that the first prayer of this brand new year. As God cries out, your Father seeketh after thee. You cry out, Father, over here. That's the story of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 7, where we find ourselves this morning. 
And the phrase is, is overused, amazing grace. We use it so tritely. It truly is the story of amazing grace. And it's all the more stunning. It's all the more startling. It's all the more stellar in light of the previous verses that I'll read in just a moment. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, Paul says, here's the situation. You weren't just wounded on a battlefield. You were stone cold dead. You were helpless and you were hopeless until God intervened. And that's where we arrive today with this, this spectacular grace. What a great way to start a brand new year, remembering two things uh, this morning. God's resounding love and his resurrection life. Those are the two things that we'll look at this morning. Resounding love and resurrection life. And so I invite you along, along with me, let's feed, let's dine on rich, fair uh, this morning, the truth of God's word. Ephesians chapter 2, I'll actually read the first seven verses. Paul writes under the very inspiration of the Holy Spirit, this, these words are infallible, they're inerrant, they're authoritative on our lives. He writes, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. And all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. And like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Now listen. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive. Uh, with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Dear ones, some of the most spectacular words in scripture, let's pray again. Oh God, marvelous. The English dictionary does not even contain enough adjectives to describe it. Oh God, I pray that, that we would bathe in your grace this morning. That we would dive deep into it. That it would minister to our troubled minds that it, your grace would pour out, your mercy would pour out all over our wounded hearts. And in God, we would be inspired by this emancipation, this liberation in which we now live. And God, I pray that we would see resounding love and resurrection life from this passage this morning. For these things, we pray in Jesus' name, and I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart might be pleasing in your sight. For God, you are my strength and my redeemer. Amen. So then, the very first thing that, that we get to bask in this morning is this resounding love of God. And let me flesh it out some uh, this morning. God, in spite of, of our sin, in spite of our deadness, our coldness toward him, is three things in this passage. He's great in his love, he's rich in his mercy, and he is amazing in his grace. And I want to talk about those three for a few minutes in just a moment. He is great in his love, he is rich in his mercy, and he is amazing in his grace. But I have to start first in verse 4 where Paul makes this transition and says, here, uh, here was your... your your, your dead condition, but now, but God. But God, those two words. In the Greek text, this is a classic statement of the gospel. And it begins with these two words, and they have such a dramatic meaning, and it's such a dramatic transition. Paul says the situation was utterly uh, in despair. But God... Martin Lloyd-Jones, the great preacher, said these two words in and of themselves, in a sense, contain the whole of the gospel. They tell us what God has done, how God has intervened 
in what otherwise was an utterly hopeless and helpless situation. We were in a deplorable condition and state, a desperate. But Paul comes and says, but God, and that changes everything. The intervention of those words, what they represent, make all the difference in the world. Although we run and we ran from God, God has not run from us. Instead, he has come to us and saved us through his grace and the power of what his son has done. He has rescued us from our terrible condition, so graphically described in these first three verses. There and here is the beauty and the wonder of the Christian gospel, the good news, the amazing news. We were hopelessly lost, but God has intervened to save us. And can I put it quite simply? If, if you understand, if I understand those two words and all the implications of them, but God, it'll save your soul. If you recall them daily, and live by them, they will transform your life completely. But God, the question is, have they? It's all about Jesus Christ, is it not? And salvation found in him. We could ask the question, why? Why has God done this? Because, and only because, he is great in his love, he is rich in his mercy, And he is amazing in his grace. And so, let me explore that for a few moments this morning. God is great in his love. It's the very definition of love. If you want to look for the purest expression of love, it's God's love. It's a resounding love. C.S. Lewis, uh, the great great writer, theologian, uh, author, described it like this, as only C.S. Lewis can. He wrote this, God who needs nothing loves into existence holy superfluous creations in order that he may love and perfect them. He creates the universe already foreseen, the buzzing clouds of flies about the cross, the flayed back pressed down upon an uneven stake, the nails driven, the repeated torture of back and arms, time and again, for breast's sake, hitched up. Herein, says Lewis, and he's right, is love. This is the diagram of love himself, the inventor of all loves. God comes to us and he says, I know who you are, and I know what you have done. But because of my great love for you, your penalty has been paid. My law's judgment against you has been satisfied through the work of my son on your behalf. And for his name's sake, I offer you everything. Forgiveness, wholeness, restoration, joy, peace. So God says to come to me. You need only come to my son, Jesus. Have you come to Jesus? Not only did God love enough to forgive, but he loved enough also to die for the very ones who had offended him. There simply is no greater expression, no greater definition of love in this entire universe. Not only is God great in his love, but he is rich in his mercy. This is luxuriant mercy, Mercy is related to love, and it flows out from love. Uh, It is favor being shown to those who deserve the precise opposite. Uh, If nothing but a proper code of reward and retribution were followed, then we would all receive God's punishment. But instead of condemning us, as God had every right to do in all of his perfection, He reached out and converted us, saved us through Jesus Christ. This is the definition of mercy. So, God is great in his love. He's rich in his mercy. And he truly is amazing in his grace. It's astounding. Absolutely unearned and undeserved Grace, by its very definition, is not based upon anything that we could do. 
Grace is receiving all the riches of our salvation, forgiveness and eternal life and abundant life even right now. Daily blessings from God through his grace. Grace is the word that's chiefly on Paul's mind uh, as he uses it over and over and over again in chapter 2 of Ephesians. Grace truly is God's riches at Christ's expense. And I'll preach so much more in detail on this in the weeks to come. Have you experienced this? God's resounding Love, not just intellectually, it's not just something that's captured in the brain, it's gone into your heart, it's gone into your soul. Have you experienced the love of all loves? If you have not, then don't wait another minute. Come to Jesus Christ, give yourself to him. And if you've done that, maybe years and years and years ago, would you not reflect once again that God loves you with this immense, invincible love No matter how long you have walked with the Lord, at times doubts creep in. And you wonder, does he really, truly love me? And the answer to that in scripture is yes. And so much more than you even recognize or realize. This resounding love of God is is higher, it's deeper, it's wider than you can even dare to imagine. And we need to soak it up. Because it causes us then to fall more and more radically in love with him. His spirit lives in us in greater and greater measure. We bring great honor to him when we are so satisfied in his love. As glorious as this resounding love is, and it is glorious, Paul doesn't stop there piling up truth upon truth, glorious truth. He doesn't stop there. Secondly, he talks about resurrection life. And he says that in verses 4 through 6. He says, God made us alive with Christ even though we were dead. And he says, by grace you have been saved. And then he says, it's not just stopping right there. You have been raised up with Christ. You've been seated with him in the heavenly places. What glorious truth uh, this is. And so I want to talk about that progression We've been made alive in Christ. We've been raised up with Christ. We are seated with Christ. Uh, This is mind-bending, mind-boggling truth. And truly, it stretches human comprehension. One way to understand this, and I'll be a little theologically technical for a few minutes, and then I'll get real practical. One way to understand this in a technical sense, theologically, is to see our union with Christ as a federal union or a covenantal uh, union. And again, this is a technical position before God as a result of Christ's work for us. And I won't read it right now, but it's described in detail in Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, Paul says, uh, we were in Adam before our salvation, but now uh, we are in Christ after our salvation. Adam was a perfect representative. He was our federal head of the human race. And Adam, as our perfect representative, sinned, and then death was passed out onto the entire human race. But in contrast, Jesus was perfect. And he is now uh, the representative or the federal head of all true believers And so now we're judged righteous because of Christ's righteousness. And so it goes like this. Because he is justified, we have been justified because we are now identified with him. Because he is exalted to heaven, we are exalted to heaven because we are identified in Christ. As Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father in glory. So we, in a sense are seated with him in glory as well because we are identified in him. It's called federalism because it is analogous to the way a citizen is involved in the actions of his country, our federal government. And so that's a bit of a theological explanation, but we could say, okay, so what about practical implications of that then? So first, we, we have been made alive. We've been made alive. 
Now we have a spiritually beating heart before God. We were dead, but now we are alive. And as a result of our union, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, before then we were unconscious of God. We were inactive in God's service. We were decaying morally and spiritually. But now we have been made alive to God. And it is the most radical of transformations. Now, by God's grace, we want to work for him. We want to grow in practical righteousness. We want to grow spiritually. We want to know more and more of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. This is the most stunning and radical transformation imaginable. And it is true of every single true Christian. If this change has not taken place, then you still need to come to faith in Christ. But if you've come to faith in Christ, the change does take place. And it definitely is progressive. God gives us a new disposition. That's what I'm saying. When it, Paul says you've been made alive in Christ, what he's saying is God has given you a brand new disposition. He's given you a completely new bent. He has turned us in a different direction. And there's new power that's working in us now that guides our faculties. And for the first time, we become sensitive uh, to God. We can understand spiritual truth and desire spiritual things, which we did not before. We now seek after godly things. A.W. Tozier, who is amazing in his writings, gave some acid tests for true spiritual life. A.W. Tozer said, you want some proofs that you've been made alive in Christ? Here they are, and he lists six. The first is this, the desire to be holy uh, rather than simply happy. The world really wants happiness. But when we've been made alive in Christ, we still have the desire to be happy. We would be crazy if we didn't. But what matters to us even more is to be holy before God. Secondly, he says, we want to see the honor of God advanced in our lives, even if, even if it means suffering. We want to see the honor of glory, of God's glory, of that honor uh, advanced in our lives, even if it means that we have to suffer. The third sign that he mentions is when you see, thing from, see things from God's viewpoint, and so now the way that you look at the world, the way that you, you look at monetary things, the way that you look at sex and purpose and in life and all these things, you start to view those now, not from a worldly perspective, but from God's viewpoint. The fourth thing that he mentions is a desire to die right rather than live wrong. I love the way that he says that. This is a sign that you've been made alive in Christ. You have this desire to die right rather than live wrong. Number five is a desire to see others advance, even at your own expense. And then the final one is you habitually make eternity judgments instead of time judgments. You're looking at things more and more in the light of eternity. What about you? If you belong to Jesus Christ, you've been made alive with Christ and it'll be seen in a way that you think, the way you perceive, the way you talk, the way that you live your life. Now it's a process, it's not instant, and yet there is progression there. We have been made alive in Christ. Secondly, then Paul says you've been raised up. If you are a Christian, you have experienced resurrection power, no less. Humanity can basically be divided into two main groups, those who have been resurrected to life and those who are still dead in their sins and transgressions. Self-help will not save those who are dead in their sins. No one can crawl out of a casket. He or she must be resurrected with Christ. But that's what Paul says has happened. That's exactly what has happened before we were dead in our sins and it affected every area of our lives, but now resurrection has come and his life touches every area of our lives. Instead of deprovement, there has come improvement. Often think when we talk about resurrection life of the literal bodily resurrection of Lazarus. And when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, 
His very first instruction to Lazarus or to the people around him was this. Unbind him and let him go. Unbind him now and let him go. The same is true for us. We are no longer creatures only of this world bound by what we can see and, and touch and smell and hear and taste. We think and work and speak in spiritual categories now. We are lifted up to an entirely new thought realm. We have a new standard of values when it comes to relationships, our language, our honesty, our integrity, our moral views. But more than that, we recognize that we belong more to heaven now than we do to earth. And it causes us to live differently. So Paul has come and said, not only will you're dead, but, but now you've been, you've been made alive in Christ. And it's, it's the best kind of life. It's vital. It's vigorous. And you've been then raised up with him to a whole other plane of thinking and acting. And then he even goes so far as to say you've been seated with Christ. With spiritual rec- resurrection comes ascension to the heights of heaven. We are not only made alive in Christ and raised in Christ, we've been seated with him in, in heaven next to God the Father. The verb that Paul uses here is in the past tense and it emphasizes that this is absolute This promise that he's speaking of, he writes it as if it had already taken place. And so we're still, we've still got boots on on the ground right now. And yet one day we will be seated uh, in, in the heavenlies with him. But because Jesus, our federal head, is already there seated our spiritual part, our dimension uh, is in a sense there with him. Even though we have not yet become inheritors of all that God has for us in Christ, to be in heavenly places is to be immersed in God's domain instead of Satan's. To be in the sphere of spiritual life instead of in the sphere of spiritual death. The powers of the spiritual realm have been brought to bear on our present life. And here's another dimension to this, of being seated with him you may never have thought of. The seat next to God in which we have been seated with Christ is a throne. It's a throne. And it means that we will reign with him. And he will always be the king of kings and lord of lords and far above us. But we will reign with him. We are extensions of Christ's presence and authority even in this world. And this seat is a seat of victory. It's a seat of security. It's a seat of privilege and rejoicing. All those things are true for everyone who has bowed the knee to Jesus Christ. As if all of this wasn't glorious enough. As if all of this wasn't spectacular enough. Paul says in verse 7 then, All of this in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Let me illustrate it this way. A Roman matron was once asked, where are your jewels? Where are your jewels? And she responded by calling her two sons to her side. And she pointed to them and said, these are my jewels. And so it is, in a sense, those of us that have been captured by the redemption of Christ are his jewels. I preached last week that we are part of his inheritance. He is going to show his all-surpassing riches, God is, of his grace to his children in a limitless future as age succeeds age and time then becomes meaningless as we're in eternity, from the moment of salvation and throughout the ages to come, we never stop receiving the grace and the kindness, the mercy, the goodness, the love of God our Father. It is endless, it is limitless. What a place to be and what a way to start a new year thinking about resounding love and resurrection life. Have you experienced 
such grace and love. We were the walking dead. But God, in his resounding love, made us alive in Christ. In his resurrection life, no less. Could anything be more superb or marvelous and magnificent? If you don't know resounding love and resurrection life, come uh, to Jesus and believe in him and receive him as your Savior and Lord. All you have to do is in sincerity, honesty, authenticity, ask him to be your Lord and Savior. Let me finish with a, a true story that goes all the way back to 500 years before Christ was even born. There was a ruler at that time. His name was Zeleucius. And he flourished right around 500 B.C. And his government over the Locrians was tough. It was, it was tough. He had a strong ruling hand. But he was also just. In one of his decrees, Zeleucius ordered that anyone convicted of adultery would be punished by the loss of both of their eyes. That was what his law was. Yikes. <laughs> but the real test of his law came when his own son was found guilty of this very crime. Zeleucius, in order to maintain justice, the authority of his laws, but also to show mercy, shared his son's penalty. And he had one of his own eyes taken out along with one of his offending sons. And it was justice, but it was mercy. We who have embraced Jesus Christ have a similar story, but it is far, far, far better. Our crimes deserve the death penalty. But God, who is rich in mercy, laid our penalty completely upon his own sinless son. Jesus was scourged. Jesus was gouged. Jesus was crucified completely in our place. Not partially. Justice was satisfied with the most costly, precious price. And it's grace. But I want to tell you, Oh, it's expensive grace. It's extravagant grace. It is exorbitant pardon. And I want us to come and ponder it and remember it at his table this morning. Let's prepare our hearts. Let's pray together. God, you're the very definition of everything good. Oh God, you're the very definition of resounding love. Thank you that you are great in that love. You are rich in your mercy. God, you're amazing in your grace. And I pray, Father, that we would come to new heights of comprehension on these truths, but I pray that it would come to to new heights of practical application to us. How we view ourselves, how we view you, how we view a lost world, how we view our family and friends and neighborhoods in this world. Surely it is it's transformative. And so Jesus, Bethlehem's baby, king of all kings, very one who was scourged, crucified for us as we come uh, to your table in a few moments. I pray that we would remember you well. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. To prepare us to come uh, to the table uh, this morning we have a responsive reading. And this responsive reading is this great passage from Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. And so, uh, would you read that responsively with me this morning? Paul writes, The Son 
is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Let's raise our, our voices now as we sing this, uh, this beautiful uh, Christmas uh, carol, All My Heart This Night Rejoices. displeasure who to say freely gave his most cherished treasure to redeem us he hath given his own son from the throne of his might uh, in heaven On the very night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you, given for you. Take, eat, I do this in remembrance of me. Like manner, he took the cup and he poured it out. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood to shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink it up. I do this in remembrance of me. And Jesus said, I won't dine at the same table again until I've got a banquet, a banquet with multitudes in heaven one day, and you'll sit at that banquet. Oh, who have named me King and Lord. And that's what we look forward to. This is a foretaste of it right now. 
This is a sacrament. It's a holy ordinance instituted by Jesus Christ wherein the benefits of the covenant of grace are not only represented before us, but they're sealed and applied to us as we come and take the sacrament. There is a bit of mystery in the sacrament that I cannot fully explain. The very presence of the Holy Spirit, the very presence of Jesus Christ is with us. And as we partake of that sacrament, we remember this everlasting, immense, invincible love of God. And it's poured out all over us this morning in this sacrament. And so it's more than just a simple, memo simple memorial. It's more than just a remembrance. We dine, in a sense, upon God's grace uh, this morning. Once again, let us turn to him in prayer. Father, what price could we pay to come to a table that represents full forgiveness, luxuriant grace, amazing love? We don't have enough. We don't have enough good works. We don't have enough money. We don't have enough uh, of anything to bring to your table. That's so ironic. We come in poverty. We come in brokenness. We come in neediness. We come abandoning our self-righteousness and clinging only to the righteousness of Christ, which is ours through faith by your grace. And so I pray uh, this morning that, that as we remember Jesus, that fresh and anew, you would liberate us. Fresh and anew, you would feed us the deepest of spiritual food. And I pray that Jesus would be so very exalted in our lives, in our church, this new year. It's in his name uh, that we pray. Alinda will distribute uh, the elements. And if you'll hold on to those, and in a moment we'll partake uh, at the same time. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and it's by his wounds that we are healed. For, for all we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and yet the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. All we like sheep have gone astray. But God demonstrates his love toward us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ uh, died for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of of God, this do in remembrance of him. What shall separate us from the love of Christ? Danger, hardship, famine, nakedness, sword? No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who has loved us, this do in remembrance of him. Let's pray that together. Oh God, feed us, renew us, restore us, enliven us. Let us bring great glory and honor to you. In 2021, I pray that Jesus would be such the centerpiece of our lives that we can honestly say with the apostle, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. These things we pray in his name. Amen.
Let's stand uh, and sing uh, together as we close joy to the world. grace and mercy and peace from God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and abide with you now and forevermore. Amen. Uh, please uh, be seated and a few announcements uh, to make this morning. And I'll be really brief uh, with those announcements, but this is a brand new year in Mountain Road and we've got some brand new things uh, that are occurring. We have two different Bible studies that are ready to start up soon uh, here in January. And if you're not getting uh, the Mountain Road e-blast, please let us know in the church office and we'll get you on that where all the details are spelled out. Uh, one of the Bible studies is on Thursday nights and it is a part two uh, of a very successful study that was in the fall. Uh, called Race, Class, and the Kingdom uh, of God. And that'll be a Zoom study and, and led by uh, the San Santa Rosas. And then I'm starting up a new Bible study that'll start, I believe, on January 20th. That'll be a Wednesday night study. And again, with COVID restrictions, um, it is a, a Zoom study. Uh, but it's called Gospel Love. And it brings to bear all the implications uh, of the gospel into our relationships. And so I invite you to read a little bit more about that uh, in detail. And we'll need to know uh, that you want to participate in one or both of those studies uh, so that you can get uh, the Zoom uh, in invitations. Also, uh, we have a bit of a really wonderful kind of outreach event, but also uh, an event just to uh, get face to face with one another with some safety precautions uh, coming up this next Saturday. So on Saturday, uh, January 9th, uh, we have a hot chocolate goodie uh, drive through coming through our church. You can stay uh, in, in your car, and we will be prepared to serve you sugar-free or regular. Who likes sugar-free hot chocolate? I'm sorry, but <laughs> give me the real stuff. But uh, some hot chocolate and some goodies, it's kind of first come, first serve. But this is something that uh, you're more than welcome to invite your friends or neighbors to also. It's Saturday, this coming Saturday from 9 to 11. Um, and we'll have it all guided for you where you can come in, stay in your car. Uh, we'll serve you. You can go right through the progression. And then uh, what I'd like to do as pastor is just to to pray a, a prayer over you as you come, as you come through uh, a blessing for this uh, nec next year. Uh, there's other announcements uh, that are in the e-blasts as well. If you have any questions or anything, uh, feel free to call uh, me or uh, Melissa uh, in, in the church office. But those are the main things I wanted to highlight. Bible study going forward too. 
uh, and then our, our hot chocolate drive through rally, whatever uh, we might want, want to call that. So please uh, come and enjoy that. It'll be good to see your face. You can keep your mask on. I'll have a mask on, but, but um, yeah, it'll be a good, a good time uh, together. Well, the peace of Christ uh, be, be with you, especially uh, in uh, this new year. Thank you for being with us, Mountain Road, this first Sunday uh, of, of a new year. Thank you.